symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode five of That Was Extreme right here on adfreeshows.com. I'm Josh Chernoff from So Says Chernoff on Fight, and as always, I am joined by the quintessential stud muffin and host of the 69-Minute Eargasm podcast, Mr. Joel Gertner, and the leader of the BWO and my co-host every Monday morning on the Mind of the Meanie podcast, which drops every Monday morning, wherever you listen to podcasts, the Blue Meanie. Meanie, what's up? Joel, how's it going? Doing good. Good, man. Good. Well, I don't know it, if, it, if it drops or it plops, but it does something. It lands. It um, lands. Um, as I mentioned in the open, it's episode five. And what better talent to cover than the master of the five-star frog splash? So today, we will be talking about the whole effing show, Mr. Monday Night Rob Van Dam. So what do you guys say we just jump right into it? I'm excited. All right. Let's RVD. Go. He was born Robert Alexander Zatowski. Definitely said that wrong. On December 18th, 1970, he grew up in Battle Creek, Michigan, a lifelong wrestling fan. He actually made his first appearance on WWF television in 1987 in a skit with the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. So at the time, for those who don't know, uh, DiBiase was selecting plants from the audience and offering to pay them to perform degrading acts and offered the 16-year-old Van Dam $100 to enter the ring and kiss his foot, which he did. Uh, do either of you remember watching that when it first aired? Uh, as, as a kid, I remember seeing that happen, but I never put two and two together that this, oh, that guy's going to be Rob Van Dam. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't How until, could you like, not have known, Meanie? Uh, Meanie stupid. Uh, it wasn't until uh, much later when they did yeah, the personality profile and pointed out that he had done it. I went, oh, my God. You know, how, how, you know that, that's so awesome. Joel, do you remember seeing that one? I do, yeah. I, uh, I was heavy into it in 87, but then I was already super into it. So um, I, all of them, the dribbling of the basketball and everything, I remember. That's the one that always stood out to me, yeah. dribbling of the basketball. Yep. Cameron Grimes uh, brought stuff like that back recently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so uh, RVD was, as most people know, formally trained under the original Sheik and credits Sheik and Sabu, of course, the Sheik's nephew, uh, for him reaching the levels he did. Van Dam was asked about his training and said, there was never, ever one time in my schooling where Sheik said, this is how to hit somebody without injuring them. This is the right way to fall without getting hurt. There was none of that. It was about grabbing each other, squeezing each other, and pinning each other. We knew we had to work with each other to a certain degree in order to pull off what we wanted to accomplish, and we were sensible, but the Sheik never one time said, hey, you're hitting him too hard. I'm from a school where I never, ever say that I am hurt because if I can keep going and you don't need to take me to the hospital, then I'm not hurt. To me, hurt means you can't work. That's why I've wrestled with broken bones, concussions, torn ACLs, and I'm not saying that's a good idea. That's the way I came up. So I'm curious your opinion, both of you. Um, you know, Many we've talked before about you training you know, in the ring with Al Snow and uh, – yeah. What do you guys think about that mindset? Obviously, very old school mindset. That is not how people are being trained in the performance center today um, or the Monster Factory or any other uh, reputable training facility. Uh, what are your thoughts on that style, that old school style of training? Uh, as far as I, I as far as I've heard, that was, you know, uh, that's the old school way of people training just to see if you can hack it, if you can, uh, you know, physically endure, you know, the, the, the grind of, you know, wor not working in a ring, but if you can, uh, you know, look good shooting, you know, and then just dial it back, right. you know, that uh, there's a lot of that mindset in the business where people go think, work, act, shoot. Uh, and that was just a, an old school style to see, uh, who was tough, you know, and who can handle it. And then, once they, you know, you pass the, uh, the muster, so to speak, 
they uh, let you into the, into the, uh, the, they pulled the curtain back and said, okay, now you can take it easy. So uh, there's a lot of way, a lot of pe people did that early in the day. And uh, it's a testament to the Sheik, you know, cause Sheik was, you know, kayfabe until the end. Uh, I had, a, I had the uh, honor of meeting the Sheik and uh, while I was training with Al and uh, there's an aura about, about that man. And uh, I just ran up, said hello real quick and got the hell away from him. Yep. <laughs> so I can only imagine training with him, uh, you know, every day, like uh, Sheik and Sabu did. He's one of those guys I always looked at. Sabu as, and Rob, I mean, Sabu yeah, and I got you. Um, he's one of those people, the, the original Sheik watching, you know, videos of him and all. He's one of those uh, wrestlers that you always looked at. And even if you, you know, were smart to the business or thought you were smart to the business, he's one of those guys where you're just like, all right, they may have said who's going to win, but there is nothing fake about that man. And, you yeah. know, and, and, uh, and that kind of goes to, again, that type of training. Joel, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that maybe that type of training um, in a way should be brought back where maybe people are kind of introduced and, and maybe down the line they're introduced to the, the show business aspect of wrestling? Or do you think cat's out of the bag and, and, and it's a good thing that we're, we're past those days? I think it depends on what you like. Uh, it, I, well, I, let's preface by saying that I was not primarily a physical performer. I'm a talker. Uh, so I've taken a few bumps. I've been a bit of a crash test dummy at worst, but I, I'm not um, probably the best person to answer the question. But since you've asked, um, it, it depends. I, as the student in the wrestling school and as the performer and the athlete, as the wrestler, it depends on your style, um, but it also depends then, you know, as a viewer and a consumer of the product, it depends on what you're looking for. If you are okay with a lot of, if you like flash, if you like gymnastics, if you like form, if you like, you know, however you want to describe it, um, then certain territories or offices or styles like lucha libre in mexico um are going to be more up your alley and those probably are more about for lack of a better term faking it and then dialing it up so that the stuff that's predetermined and choreographed looks as real as possible mm -hmm. if the style that you like is an all japan strong style or an ecw or even like a Bill Watts Mid-South, then you're looking for a shooter's style where it's more how much can we beat each other up and go legitimate while dialing it down so that we can do it five or six times a week. So it just it depends on what you're looking for. Um, well, hey, so this was the way, like it or not, the way that RVD was trained, and he seemed to he seems to look back on it uh, very positively. Um, RVD made his wrestling debut in 1990 and wrestled in many independent promotions, uh, including the USWA, uh, South Atlantic Pro Wrestling, uh, and many, many more. In June of 91, RVD was competing for the USWA, working nine matches in two months, facing the likes of Chris Candido, Samu, Tex Slazinger, and Danny Davis. Um, and it was in November that Rob began working for ICWA territory in Florida. He worked against uh, the Long Riders, Jerry Flynn, and the Master Blaster. He continued working in Florida until March of 92, but it was October 3rd, 1993, where in, in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, where Rob Van Dam worked two enhancement matches for the WWF under the name Matt Byrne, which I thought was <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, he lost both of those matches, of course, to the Mountie and Sid Justice in primetime wrestling and wrestling challenge tapings, respectively. Uh, before we go any further, let's, you know, we, we, we're, we're starting to talk about the early days of him. When did the both of you first see Rob Van Dam? And then when did you both first meet him? Uh, we'll start with you, Joel. I was aware of him through reading the sheets and stuff and magazines. So he was on my radar as early as Memphis, South Atlantic Pro. All of that resonates. And and and, and I'm reminded when you say it, 
that he was in all of those different places in the early 90s. But if the question is, when did I see him for the first time? I think even though I was trading tapes at the time, it's quite possible that the first time I really saw him, especially, you know, currently week to week, like taped and then shown pretty much right away, uh, would have been the WCW stuff that he did as, was he Robbie V or Robbie, Robbie Z? Robbie V. Yeah, and we'll get Robbie to that in a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's probably episodically. So I don't mm. know if that's 92. I don't know when that was exactly. But I think that's the first time I saw Rob uh, a few years before ECW. Okay. Uh, Meany, when did you first see him? We'll talk about when you guys met him a little bit down the line. But when did you first see him? When I first saw him... Uh, pretty much uh through wcw when he was robbie v uh when i was doing the memphis trips with uh joel goodhart's uh square circle fan club i think i missed him down there by a couple months mm. I, I would have been able to see him in a, as a fan because uh, candido was down there around the time i went to watch the shows and stuff like that and then um yeah, I, then yeah, he made tv i might have seen him in the after magazines in the introdu- introducing section as a uh, you know robbie v uh uh and yeah but like mostly wrestling through uh wcw as robbie v he would wrestle scotty flamingo you know who would go on to become raven and uh, a lot of those you uh, there's some uh you know I, i'm jumping ahead a little bit or maybe not but uh you know, i got to talk to like sabu about those times in memphis and you know rob and sabu went down to memphis with a one of their uh, friends, Judge Dredd, and, uh, you know, they went down there and, and did a couple loops and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, Sabu and uh, I want to see Sabu and Judge Dredd or Sabu and Rob work, you know, Jeff Jarrett and uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Colonel Robert Parker. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on his name right now. Uh, legendary Tennessee, the Tennessee stud, Robert Fuller. I had to say it in full. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably right around the time I start seeing him. Uh, So it was January 25th, 1993, when RVD made his WCW Saturday night debut. So, yeah, so you guys would have been familiar with him in 93 in that time period. Uh, And he made the debut, as uh, Joel had mentioned earlier, under the name Robbie V. Uh, Bill Watts reportedly did not like the name Van Damme, uh, so he shortened it to Robbie V. Uh, The following month, Robbie V entered a tournament for the vacant World Television Championship defeating Shanghai Pierce in the first round, but lost to Vinny Vegas in the second round. I had no idea what ever happened to that guy. Uh, uh, and that aired March 20th on an episode of Worldwide. Um, it is interesting going through some of these names. You know, we talked about people like uh, Chris Candido, of course, he would have so much interaction with an ECW. Uh, Tex Slazinger and Shanghai Pierce were both mentioned. And for the life of me, I can't remember which one was which, but they ended up being the Godwins. Years yeah. later. So a lot of people, and then of course, you know, Vinny Vegas, uh, Kevin Nash. So a lot of people, uh, he interacted with a lot of guys who would go on to become some pretty big names in the business. Um, it is interesting to note, since this is a show where we primarily talk about ECW, it's interesting to note that just 10 days before RVD would show up in WCW, on January 15th, Paul Heyman was fired by Bill Watts. Um, and according to, To the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Paulie Dangerously was officially fired on January 15th by WCW by a letter faxed to him from Bill Watts. Watts in the letter claimed that WCW's investigation of Dangerously's expense reports turned up falsified reports at the Ramada Hotel Atlanta Airport South for dates in April, May, June, and July of this past year. Watts' letter also claimed that the Ramada Hotel confirmed Dangerously wasn't registered as a guest on the dates claimed in his expense reports. And, quote, it appears that you induced Ramada Hotel to provide false information that you did stay at the hotel to support fraudulent expense reports and attempt to obtain improper payments of approximately $1,200. Uh, Watts also claimed that it appears dangerously may have falsified other expense reports as well, uh, reportedly during the four month period, uh, dangerously turned in receipts from the hotel totaling over $1,100 for 39 dates. According to a hotel official that, uh, the observer contacted, there is no question dangerously stayed at the hotel during that time period. Although the official claimed 
they would be unable to prove how many dates. Dangerously signed a two-year contract with WCW and Kip Fry on April 1st, 1992, worth between base salary, performance incentives, and expenses well in excess of $200,000 per year. The contract also listed him as a TBS employee rather than an independent contractor. This would have made him the only performer in the company designated as such, so the contract was somewhat precedent-setting for a pro wrestling performer. All of that from The Observer. Uh, do either of you remember this time period of Paul Heyman uh, being fired? Obviously, Paul Heyman leaving WCW uh, would go on to become the catalyst for ECW. Um, without him leaving WCW, ECW never happens uh, in the form that, that we all know and love. Uh, do you guys remember this whole story and how much of it do you think is accurate? How much of it do you think is, uh, you know, the wrestling business and, you know, telephone, telegram, telewrestler? Um, Meanie, what do you think? I definitely, uh, I don't know what, I, I definitely remember it happening. I was a uh, newsletter subscriber at the time uh, and then having going on to work with Paul and know his disdain for wcw and his mistrust of wcw to the point where when uh wrestle wrestle palooza 98 was held in atlanta uh, we were strictly advised not to stay at a certain hotel because he was afraid wcw would have officials uh set up uh decoys there to uh <laughs> set up and have us arrested and all this stuff and you know somebody i was rooming with got, got a room there and i was like what are you doing you're going to get us fired but yeah, uh, that is the lore of uh, Paul Heyman. Uh, hey, he, he the hotel uh, vouched for him, so right. uh, I wonder if they uh, s sent him to WCW through FedEx. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Paul's good uh, with the old FedEx there. But uh, yeah, uh, I don't. Hey, if the hotel vouches for Paul, I'll go. I'll go for Paul. But uh, it's 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 definitely part of. Uh, the allure that is uh paul Heyman because he's such a character you know i i wouldn't put it past him so <laughs> joel you remember uh hearing about this paul Heyman's departure from uh from wcw i remember reading about like mimi said i remember reading about it in the sheets and i remember that that was the um the depending on how you measure that was either the reason or that was the excuse that was given for um for bill watts letting him go uh, so in February, Rob Van Dam traveled to Japan on an All Japan tour, but returned to WCW in March uh, and would stay there until early June, working mostly house shows and dark matches. Uh, he did face Paul Orndorff. Uh, Orndorff? That's an interesting way to pronounce his name. Paul Orndorff uh, for the WCW World Title, uh, World TV Championship. Man, I'm, I'm knocking it out of the park today. Uh, on March 23rd, 1993's WCW Saturday Night. Uh, his last match was a WCW house show on June 6, 1993, when he teamed with Brad Armstrong to defeat the Wrecking Crew. Van Dam uh, spent most of his time after leaving WCW working for uh, All Japan Pro Wrestling and NWA Independent shows until ECW House Party 1996, when he would debut for ECW. This is from the January 15th Wrestling Observer Newsletter. ECW debuted Rob Van Dam and brought back Shane Douglas and Mr. Hughes on the show. Van Dam, who will probably be a heel, beat Axel Rotten. Douglas and Hughes were back together, and Douglas said he'd teach Bubba Ray Dudley uh, to speak English. Also expected uh, in starting January 26th are the Headhunters, while Chris Jericho and Juventud Guerrera are scheduled to start in February. Man, 1996 was such a turning point for ECW. Um, yeah. That Just looking at the names that were there. Uh, just two months into his ECW run, Van Dam would receive his first title shot against Too Cold Scorpio for the World TV title uh, on March 30th. The match ended in a draw with Scorpio retaining the championship. Meltzer gave the match three and a half stars saying... Too Cold Scorpio retained the TV title, beating Rob Van Dam. The match was supposed to go 29 minutes and 59 seconds with them teasing the draw but doing the pin at the end. The match had a lot of good moves but lacked in psychology 
and the crowd reactions weren't much. When they announced five minutes left, the crowd booed because they were thinking draw. At the 10-second announcement, Scorpio went to the finish, but it took him 15 seconds to do it, and everyone knew it. Van Damme got a great ovation for doing the job and worked very hard. Um, do you guys remember that? Were you? I can't remember. I know you were there in 96. Were you there at this point? Yeah, I was there at this point. And, uh, yeah, the match, I don't know, the match was a great match. Uh, I mean, it got, what, three and a half stars. Yeah. But then the I way mean, he, he spe- Meltzer speaks about it, um, was a little different. Yeah, you you would have thought, thought a match of this caliber would be up his uh, his uh, alley, but uh, up his uh, stone washed jeans. But uh, <laughs> just uh, no, it was a great match. Uh, the thing I, I love about watching Van Dam and Scorpio work together is they bring it. Uh, mm-hmm. They give it and they take it, and they you know they give it and they expect it back. Uh, it was a good match, good snug match. Um, you know. Uh, you know, the ECW crowd, uh, you know, like it, it's been said, been said you know, many times before, you know, before you even come down the aisle, they already know everything about you. So they right. knew what to expect from, you know, Rob Van Dam. Scorpio had been there for a while. And this was a, a dream match of sorts. I'm not sure if they had worked, you know, together before on Independence, but they, this is certainly the first time in ECW. And it, I mean, it was a great match. Um, do you got at this point, you know, you're both there. Do you remember when you first officially met Rob Van Dam um, as, as people in the business? Do you remember the first time? The first time I met Rob Van Dam was almost exactly a year earlier. Uh, I was working for Sabu in uh, Michigan. It was January 6, 1995 uh, for NWA Sabu. And the uh, main event was Sabu versus Rob Van Dam. And, uh, that's the first time I met Rob in the locker room. Very, uh, gracious guy, very, uh, you know, approachable talked for a little bit. So, uh, when eventually we caught up in, uh, ECW, I, I was surprised that he remembered me from, uh, the times working for uh, Sabu in Michigan. So, yeah. Joel, when was the first time you met Rob? His first night in with us. Yeah. I don't think I met him before that. Um, ECW Matter of Respect, 1996. Rob Van Dam would defeat Sabu in a Matter of Respect match uh, that earned them four stars from Meltzer. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about Van Dam and Sabu, as you just mentioned, were main eventing the, the, the match at the show that you first met Van Dam, Meany. Um, yeah. Obviously, the fact that's that back, they, That's back, by the way, Josh, when four stars meant something. Oh yeah. yeah, you get four stars for brushing your teeth. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it's yeah. A, it, I, you know what? All kidding aside, that is important to note, yeah. and I feel like we've mentioned that once before uh, because the four, you know, four stars. It was four stars out of five. That's a big deal. Four stars out of an arbitrary yeah. number that he decides to you know pull out of his ass. Totally different situation. So uh, again, I'll, even four I'll, stars, just one man's opinion. But yeah. I remember there was a you know. The, a little sidebar. I remember, you know, the five, you know, four star match meant something. There was an ECW house show. I would say it was balls versus Axel somewhere. And, um, it gets on the, on the, uh, mic. It says, you know, he's playing on having a, a five star match. I can't remember the exact verbiage, but he got the, you know, this is a random ECW house show and he got the crowd to chant five star match. Five star match. <laughs> In the way Mick Foley, only Mick Foley could do and get away with and uh, not totally, you know, you know, turn people off with it. People were, were, were in on the joke and got a, got it, and it was pretty funny. Yeah, that's when the four and five-star matches meant something. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. <laughs> so from, from the Observer, as it relates to this match uh, that we're talking about, uh, the Matter of Respect match, he says, Rob Van Dam pinned Sabu. In 18 minutes, 47 seconds with a split-legged moonsault. I remember when that was his finisher. Um, This was said to be not quite at the level of previous matches, uh, but lots of incredible spots. The loser was supposed to say, I respect you, to the winner. Sabu was selling his injuries as if he had broken his back and never said anything. Joey Styles then interviewed Van Damme, who said he didn't respect Sabu, and then shook Bill Alfonso's hand. Paul Heyman came out with Sabu, who talked for the first time, mumbling about respecting Van Damme and offered his hand. 
but Van Dam blew him off and shook Alfonso's hand. Sabu ended up going out on a stretcher. The post match came off live a lot messier than it reads. And uh, in my Josh's opinion, uh, boy, does it read messy. Um, that match was actually their second match in ECW uh, together. The third taking place at ECW Hardcore Heaven 96, where Sabu would defeat Van Dam in another four star match. Um, Meltzer had a write up on this one as well. Uh, between the sound system going out and the ring and ring cables breaking, it wasn't until about 2.30 a.m. that the Sabu versus Rob Van Dam main event at the June 22nd ECW Arena event went into the ring. Two minutes into the match, the top rope broke. The two basically ignored it and went through with their scheduled match, with the show ending at about 12.45 a.m., with both Sabu and Van Dam doing stretcher jobs after Sabu had scored the win using the Arabian face buster, despite the fact that the top ropes were broken. In the process, it appeared Sabu re-injured his hand. Uh, thus ended Hardcore Heaven 96, one of ECW's best shows, according to most reports. We did also get several negative complaints regarding the show, citing it lasted too long and about all the mechanical problems. Certainly its longest and the company's all-time record crowd as well. A crowd reported at an excess of 1,500 jammed the ECW <laughs> arena for a five-hour-long show. It was, always, it was always over 1,500. Let's the get that show, The show had more technical down points than ever before, but even more amazing up points. Besides the ring problems, which Paul Heyman, after the show, was blaming on 911, who runs Ted Petty's ring business, uh who he claimed gave them a bad ring, blaming it on ECW, giving Brian Lee the choke slam finishing move. Uh, there was another major in-ring hurdle in regards to the much-hyped Taz versus Paul Varelins. I'm not saying his name right. Uh, Varlins. So, Varlins. Varlins. So-called shoot fight. Um, so, all right. That was a, a mouthful from the Observer. Uh, question. Uh, one, does he know uh, punctuation? Two, do you remember this night and all the technical difficulties? Uh, do you remember any other instances as well of issues like this and how it was handled with placing the blame? Um, you know, we're talking about Paul Heyman. Uh, uh, we're hearing that Paul Heyman was running around backstage blaming this one, blaming that one. Is that how you remember it? Or how do you remember this night um, being handled? Do you want to go first? I, I could, I mean, you know, I remember Kimona Wanalea dancing atop the ECW <laughs> arena, Extreme Warfare Volume 2. Anyone that was who, due to anyone who's anyone who ever watched it. an episode of ECW yeah. remembers the night Kimona Wanalea danced atop the ECW arena. Um, a little piece then, of useless, a little piece of useless knowledge to uh, the night Kimona Wanalea danced atop the <laughs> ECW arena. <laughs> There's a so moment. I, I don't... There's a moment where she's dancing and a hand comes through the drywall <laughs> with a dollar bill, going <laughs> like this, and uh, that hand happened to belong to uh, Scotty Riggs, who was a WCMW <laughs> employee at the time who came That's by awesome. the show that night. So technically, Scotty Riggs, a WCW employee, employee uh, made an, uh, his hand made an appearance on the ECW show. Well, he wound up working with us, so I guess that actually makes that his debut, technically, yes. right? <laughs> I think that yeah. should count. I think that should count. <laughs> no. One of the most memorable moments in ECW history, uh, the night Kimono won a lay. All right, so, yeah, Joel. Uh, so oh, there yeah. was that. No, no, no worries. Um, But there was that. But the rest of it, like, you had said 2.30 first before you said 12.45. Yeah. So I don't know. And Meltzer sometimes, especially when it comes to numbers or whatever, it's a typewritten sheet and not, mm -hmm. and this is not, you know, being derogatory towards him, but even people who are huge fans of his work, even himself probably mm -hmm. will admit that there are a lot of typos in the average observer. And so listen, I don't know whether I mean, when you time difference, he lives out in California. Um, yeah. so all, you know, we like to, we like to, you know, bust balls, but <laughs> I, it's understandable that, that, that could have been. Uh, mixed up a little bit in the in the writing there, sure. And the this twelve forty five checks out, but the two when you first said two thirty, the only time I've ever worked 
in front of the curtain on camera that late in wrestling was Gathering of the Juggalos. With the exception <laughs> of working Juggalos at like 3.45 in the morning. to Now, cutting promos in Dudleyville under the trestle, if you count that, I've definitely been at work in ECW until 5.30, 5.45 in the morning. But we've never done any matches in front of fans as late as 2.30. Everything was always wrapped up by about 12.30, 12.45. Uh, but as far as the malfunctions, I don't, I don't really, uh, they don't stand out. Uh, as far as like ring uh, issues, uh, this might have been the cherry on top of the cake to, for ECW, towards ECW getting their own ring and having their own ring crew. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember, you know, ECW had been renting, you know, some Teddy rings, uh, as you want to call them up until then. So most notably, uh, ECW had one of the rings that they used for studio 54 back in the day. And they had the studio 54 logo in the middle ring. But there was another, uh, instance where ECW had rented a, a Teddy ring. And when they got the ring, got to the build uh, in Jim Thorpe, it was, and the ring was so bad. Like it was disgusting. Like there was like mud. There was like, it was like all the, that whoever had used it before, they hadn't even bothered cleaning the canvas before that. So there was a, um, a meeting at the hotel uh, bar that night where they pulled the, uh, the ring crew guy in there and, you know, gave him the third degree, you know, when, you know, brother, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and the guy, and the guy's like get mouthy with Taz. I'm like, probably you, I, I had to, I had to put my hands up and walk away. Cause I didn't, I didn't want to seem from like good fellows to happen, you know, yeah, probably not a good idea to get mouth. With with different kind of showing. So that happened. And then the ring, you know, breaks and then they have to, you know, have kimono, you know, go out there to kind of keep the, uh, the crowd at bay, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so they get the ring fixed. And, uh, I'm sure the blue haired old ladies who are coming in from midnight bingo were, uh, none too pleased. <laughs> themselves. But, uh, you know, this is maybe like the second time I've seen a ring. Break. I've seen Sabu and Scorpio on a show in, uh, Michigan when I was, you know, breaking in, did a superplex off the top rope and it was an old wooden ring. I sound like Rob Burgundy. It was an old wooden ring. <laughs> and uh, on the superplex, the side beam went like that. So they went to shoot each other in the ring. And so it's like, it was maybe my like second time in my career I've seen a ring like that. But, uh, and, you know, the Sabu Van Dam uh, incident. Yeah, I think that was the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the straw that broke the camel's back towards ECLB going, screw it. We got to get our own ring. <laughs> Um, so August 2nd, 1996, ECW, the doctor is in Sabu and RVD once again, uh, competing against each other this time in a stretcher match. This was their fourth encounter in this series. Uh, Sabu would defeat Rob Van Dam after, uh, Van Dam missed a plancha to the outside, hitting the railing and falling onto the stretcher. Uh, later that month at natural born killers, that's a K I L L A Z because man, it was, it was the mid to late nineties and we did yeah. that a lot. Um, Van Dam defeated Doug Furnace in a match post match. Van Dam offered Furnace a handshake, but Furnace instead hit Van Dam with a short arm clothesline starting a rivalry between the two. Uh, after his rivalry with Furnace expanded to also include uh, Dan Crawford. Is that how you pronounce his name? Crawford. Crawford. Uh, okay, Crawford. Uh, I knew him as, is, is that Philip Lafon? Yes. Okay. Um, anyway, Van Dam, uh, I, I can pronounce Philip Lafon, but apparently can't pronounce the other name. Van Dam wanted a tag team partner of his own afterwards. Um, so after losing to longtime rival Sabu, once again at Unlucky Lottery, the two united and formed what was to become one of the most successful tag teams in ECW history. A uh, question for the both of you. You were both on this show. Um, we talked before that you were working with the company. Meany, you were managing Raven. Uh, and yeah. Joel, you were the ring announcer for this show. Uh, any memories of that night? Uh, just another crazy e- night in the ECW. Uh, what was the name of the show again? Uh, uh, this one was The Doctor Is In. Or the doc- yeah. The, 
Yeah, this that was a great. Oh, I'm sorry. No, Natural Born Killers was this one. Oh, okay. Because I thought you- now, Doctor is in real quick. Before I forget, I've heard sure. that Tony Khan was in attendance at the Doctor is in. Ah. He was. That's Some, the somebody night told me yeah after the fact that yeah. That was the night uh, we came at uh, BWO came out as Kiss. And, nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that was the the next night, the night before he was at the Lulu Temple. But wow. uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, uh, I mean, this was like during ECW's heyday, man. So it was another great show. Uh, uh, the the crazy thing about you know ECW is like while you're you're in the, you're in it, you know, uh, you don't really get the chance to take it in. You're watching the show, but you're on to the next show. But to go sure. back and watch some of these shows, like for uh, specials like these, uh, I thought it was a really good show, man. Uh, and the, the the hopscotch back a, a couple spots. Uh, uh you know the the matter of respect matches he were they were having that's when uh that uh spawned rob to start coming out to pantera's uh song called walk where the part goes dun, 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 reach respect mm-hmm. and they, they would just loop that part over and over with the respect and stuff like that wow. so that i did not that, know that that's why he yeah uh, eventually they had them the match Pardon me. Uh, the match. Uh, <laughs> my my, my uh, mainframe rebooted up here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's a joke in there. I can't find it. But uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, they, they had that match to where, uh, you know, Rob Van Dam disrespected Sabu. Next match they had, he started coming out to Pantera's Walk with. Where sound guy Randy just looped the song, the part where it says, you know, respect, and then, you know, did his magic with the song. But going back to this show, it only made sense that, you know, uh, Rob Van Dam and Taz would team up because sometimes the best opponents make the best tag team partners. Sa- as, as we Sabu, call. you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking because Sabu used to feud all the time with Taz. And that was going to be my next point. You know, Sabu and Taz killed each other and then they went on to become a great tag team becoming tag team champions now you see sabu and van damme killing each other in the ring it's only made sense for them to be you know meshed together as a tag team much like why paul Heyman formed public enemy because he saw grunge and teddy wrestle each other on independent show so well they're if they're great opponents they make a great tag team so this goes along the lines of paul Heyman's psychology of they're great opponents they'll make an even better team and of course you know the real life relationship between the two uh with sabu yep. playing such a, a large role in rob van damme's training and the start of his career um yeah so yeah it, it, you look at that and there's just chemistry built in there um cyber slam 1997 the hey, eliminators quick. oh yes real, real yes, quick Joel, please rob van damme using walk by pantera mm-hmm led to Rob Van Dam as original music using Walk by Kilgore. Yes. Which led to ECW appearing on MTV because in whatever year it was, I think the year 2000, MTV did their compilation of like the top 100 rock videos, Mm -hmm. A through Z. And in the Ks is Kilgore doing Walk. And the video for that is essentially all of us in ECW being filmed downstairs at the Elks Lodge in Queens, New York, the Madhouse of Extreme. Wow. That's a, that's a fun fact there that everybody, the fans of the show, get to get to learn. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Absolutely. Cyber Slam 1997, the Eliminators defeat Rob Van Dam and Sabu um, for the ECW World Tag Team Championship. This was a tables and ladders match. Uh, from the Observer, the show opened with Sabu and Rob Van Dam losing a ladders and tables match to the Eliminators in more than 20 minutes, and for the rest of the show, the heat level was way down. The previous night in Queens, Eliminators beat Sabu and Van Dam in 21 12, a uh, ladders and tables match, which lot, which with lots of crazy moves and a typical lack of psychology. Sabu did a triple jump moonsault starting by jumping off the ladder, springboarding on the top rope, and doing the moonsault. Sabu and Van Dam argued after the matches both nights, and in Philadelphia, 
Sabu wound up shaking hands with the Eliminators after Van Dam walked off. Um, let's talk a little bit about ECW Barely Legal 1997. Of yeah. course, uh, Rob Van Dam defeats Lance Storm. Van Dam was not originally on the card and was a fill-in for the injured Chris Candido. Um, we talked all about this um, in our our first episode covering Barely Legal, uh, available in the archives at adfreeshows.com. Uh, the match got two and a half stars. Um, Meltzer was positive Van Dam was headed for WCW as well. Um, he did not. In May 1997, ECW invaded the World Wrestling Federation's Monday Night Raw television show, upsetting color commentator Jerry Lawler. Lawler then promised he would show up at an ECW show in order to gain revenge, and when he did show up, he had ECW mainstays Van Dam and Sabu with him. Van Dam made speeches about how he was too good for ECW and deserved to be in one of the, quote, big two, obviously referencing WWF, or WCW, uh, on one of their Monday night programs, Lawler began to call Van Dam Mr. Monday Night on an episode of Raw, which became a moniker that would stay with Van Dam, changing to suit the day of the week of whichever program was being broadcast. Despite his arrogance and betrayal of ECW, over time Van Dam became applauded by fans, recognizing his athleticism and unique maneuvers um, and becoming a, a true fan favorite. In the May 5th, 1997 edition of The Observer, Meltzer backtracked and doubled down all at the same time, saying, uh, at this point, it appears the whole Rob Van Dam deal has turned into a total angle. Van Dam was at one point talked about by WCW officials as being close to a done deal, but nothing more has been done about it. My feeling is that the initial you sold out reaction was so strong that Van Dam uh, when he was negotiating that it turned into an angle to help add to his heat, Van Dam's new gimmick, being the guy who wants to work Mondays for the rival promotion, has boosted him to being one of the most over heels in the group. Officially, he's only agreed to stay in ECW through the middle of June. However, he has yet to uh, give notice to All Japan, and if he was going to WCW in late June, one would think he would have done so already. Um, Heyman said that Van Dam can do the role that he had first thought would go to Jerry Lawler as being the anti-ECW outsider, and this way he doesn't have to deal with Lawler. It would make sense for Van Dam to appear on Raw once to get his Monday night gimmick over. Um, a lot there, uh, as always with Meltzer. Um, the, what do you make of the suggestion, the inference perhaps, that... Van Dam's uh, gimmick about wanting to go to one of the big two got over so well that he decided to pretty much stay in ECW and ride out the gimmick. Um, I, sounds... pretty much, I pretty much think that was the whole storyline altogether. Right. Uh, you know, that was, you know, it all kicked off, you know, like we said, with uh, Barely Legal. Mm -hmm. He wasn't originally slated to be on there. And so he went with the storyline of, or the inference that, you know, hey, you know, they didn't even want me on here, but now that I won, I'm worth more money here and more money elsewhere. So I don't know why, if he, if he was supposedly on the way out to WD, WWE, Paul would even allow that on his television. Right. Uh, or so to, or have, you know, you know, Candido was coming to the shows and, uh, he was, you know, stopping at the offices in Stanford to get the WWF flags for, you know, Van Damme <laughs> to bring to the ring and all that good stuff. But, uh, yeah. And it's amazing what he, uh, thought was two stars now and considered seven stars now, but, uh, that's a whole nother thing. Yep. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think the whole plan was to have Rob just play the storyline out because ECW was, you know, the rage against the machine, right. uh, promotion, even though as we come to learn, you know, later on, WWE was helping, you know, allies with, you know, ECW all along. But, uh, I, I, I kind of remember like a little, uh, a story I heard from those days of like, uh, you know, uh, 
Rob Van Dam would go to Raw, and he he was working, uh, you know, Hardy on TV, and he was working the. I think he was supposed to work Road Dog on TV or something like that, and there was friction there or something like that, and they didn't want to work together, or I forget what it was, but you know, what Rob ended up working uh, Jeff Hardy and uh, having a hell of a match, uh, almost like a, a future uh, dream match, so to speak. So, yeah, uh, I think that that was the plan all along. And uh, I don't know where he's getting the other stuff with going to WCW. I know WCW had hoped to get him for the uh, the I, the Glacier character, <laughs> almost iceberg. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm rambling on that. But yeah, short story long. Iceberg Goldberg. Yeah, they did have Goldberg. So Goldberg, Iceberg, Glacier, same thing, I guess. Hearing it here first, uh, Meany confirms that Rob Van Dam was meant to debut as Goldberg's cousin, Iceberg, (laughs) uh, for a feud. That's a t-shirt. Look for that soon at ProSlingTees.com slash that was extreme. Um, Not an ad, just letting you guys know. Don't want to get it. Uh, But speaking of heat, uh, ECW Heat Wave. 1997, Rob Van Dam, Sabu, and Jerry Lawler would face Tommy Dreamer, Sandman, and Ravishing Rick Rude in a steel cage that went to a no contest. Rob Van Dam and Sabu, uh, uh, their shocking turn at uh, Barely Legal, uh, having, well, I mean, it wasn't even so much a turn as it was having Bill Alfonso join them, Bill Alfonso's turn on Taz, um, and siding with Rob Van Dam and Sabu. Uh, RVD would he'd betray ECW for the WWF. Um, he'd form his alliance with Jerry Lawler and then they would have, uh, this matchup. Um, one of the things that now, obviously in this match, it wasn't like a real, uh, uh, competitive match for Rick Rude. He came out, uh, to compete as dreamer and Sandman's third partner, but he quickly turned on them, uh, hitting a clothesline to dreamer, which led to Beulah McGillicuddy slapping, Rude, uh, Rude tossed her into the cage wall. I uh, threw chairs into the cage and then locked the cage with RVD, Sabu, and Lawler attacking Dreamer and Sandman inside the cage with the chairs until Taz made the save. Um, RVD and Sabu escaped the cage, but Lawler was trapped inside the cage and Taz uh, knocked him, uh, choked him out with a Taz mission uh, until Rick Rude and the triple threat attacked him. Uh, how was Rick Rude? able to even do so much as a clothesline. Um, I don't mean physically, I mean legally. Because yeah, Rick yeah. Rude, you know, he had his insurance, his, his uh, uh, Lloyd's of London policy. Um, any idea? Do you guys remember the backstage? Meaning, I know you've told the story once about how secretive, you know, uh, that, you know, Rick Rude was being... Do either of you, Joel, maybe we'll start with you. Do you remember any conversation there? Any like, okay, he can do this, but he can't do that. Or how do you make that work? You announce him as your partner and he can, and he does a move in the ring. That seems a little, little risky. So as a manager, right, I've always been on defense. I've always been taking bumps and finishers, mm-hmm. but never really, except for Cyrus a little bit, laying in a kick or two. And then me and Meanie actually have been in there against each other in the year 2000. But aside from Cyrus and pretty much Meanie, that's pretty much it. Um, now, the reverse would be Rick Rude. I wasn't privy to any of the discussion actually that night in the room. But from what I understand of his policy, the way Lloyds of London interpreted it and, and the way they had an understanding of the business was that I think Rick Rude had more leniency and more rope um, if he was on offense Mm. since pro wrestling is choreographed. So if he's the one throwing a punch only or throwing a clothesline only, for whatever reason, I think Lloyds of London would have been more okay with that than him taking a back bump, taking a body slam, taking a finisher. And that I makes sense. I think that's how, because honestly, if he were to go into acting, right, mm-hmm. him throwing a punch, that that's the kind of thing he should be, if he can do it without getting hurt, he should be allowed to do it without getting hurt. You sure. shouldn't have to be wheeled around in a wheelchair just because you're on a disability policy. So I, I think, you know, talking only slightly out of my ass, I, I think <laughs> that's the extent of it. Yeah. 
Right, so that's a half observer right there because it's only slightly <laughs> out of your ass. Um, Meany, do you concur? I mean, that makes perfect sense what Joel's saying. Absolutely. And I think, uh, you, know, you know, Joel definitely had more of a closer relationship with uh, Rick. I mean, I worked with Rick and I was fortunate enough to be in the ring while, you know, we had the pre-show workouts. He would come in the ring and show some stuff. You know, I'd never really taken bumps, but showing us how to protect ourselves. But, you know, Joel and, uh, you know, Rick definitely spent more time together. So that, you know, I concur with everything uh, Joel says. Let's, uh, let's jump ahead to ECW Hardcore Heaven 97. Um, we have a uh, Monday Night Rules match. Rob Van Dam with Bill Alfonso <laughs> versus Al Snow. Uh, oh. Here's some... So here are some notes from The Observer uh, from August 25th, 1997. Before the show went on the air, they shot an angle in the building where two members of the rap band Insane Clown Posse were in the ring putting over <laughs> their uh, favorite wrestler, Rob Van Dam. Van Dam then turned on them, giving one a spin kick and another a tiger driver and put him in a camel clutch. Sabu came out in a suit trying to look like the Sheik and he is and it says in here, he is looking more and more like him by the day uh, and joined in until Sandman made the save. That didn't last long, though, as Sabu threw a chair at Sandman and Van Dam kicked a chair into Sandman's head. Sabu came off the top rope with the chair and then put the chair on Sandman uh, while he came off the top rope uh, at the same time onto him. Sandman did a stretcher job and was taken out in an ambulance. Rob Van Dam pinned Al Snow in 13 minutes and 43 seconds. But before the match, uh, they billed that it would be, in fact, fought under Monday night rules. <laughs> Although that played no part in anything, uh, Van Dam had WWF, WCW, and ECW all tie-dyed on his uh, ring outfit. Um, tie-dye, if I can just interject, was not what it was. It was airbrushed, um, but I guess... Uh, uh, I guess Meltzer isn't familiar with the difference between airbrush and tie dyed, but it's certainly it, no stone wash. Yeah, I was gonna say if it's not stone wash, he doesn't yeah. give a shit. Yeah. Um, honestly, it's uh, I, I hate to say this on this show, but it's somewhat exhausting to read um, some of these opinions by by Dave Meltzer, and not just because he's not familiar with what airbrushing is, but um, you know he he. Enjoyed the match a decent amount. He thought it wasn't as good as previous matches, but thought that uh, that it was still decent. Gave it two and three quarter stars. Um, one of the big things to come out of this possibly wasn't the first time, but um, but in my research I found it here. The Van Daminator. Um, was there ever any backlash from talent as it relates to that move? Now I know the chair shots. That was a common thing in ECW. But when a guy basically says, here's my finish, more or less, um, did either of you ever have the pleasure of taking the Van Daminator? Uh, and, and as I asked before, was there ever any, any backlash on that move? I don't recall any backlash, but I do remember uh, there was a night in Revere where uh, me and Nova were wrestling PG-13, and uh, we won the match, and we're celebrating. And uh, Rob was scheduled to come out and lay both of us out. It was Van Daminators and, uh, you know, lay us out. So he comes in, hits us, hits us, hits us. And uh, Fonzie sets up the chair in front of my face for him to kick the chair. And instead of hit me, the chair went whoop, and like grazed. And I it barely touched me. And I felt like a piece of shit for selling it and went down. <laughs> but no not only did I feel like a piece of shit for go selling it and going down, I knew Nova was about to get get it twice as hard <laughs> for for the makeup pop. You know, like you know, mm -hmm. somebody you know botches, you know, the first thing, the second person to get it always gets it twice as hard just to make up for the first one. So the chair went. Whoom, I went. I went down. Went shit. So <laughs> selling, and I'm like. You know, my stomach, I'm like giving, you know, Nova the half eye and they, they gave him what I call the Tom and Jerry when uh, the cat hits the mouse with the dust pan and you oh. see the input. <laughs> He's like Han Solo in there and they, uh, <laughs> you know, just, man, that was, that was a rough, rough night for Nova. Joel, <laughs> did you ever take uh Van Daminator? 
I didn't. I, I and I don't think in Dudley's versus Van Dam and Sabu, I ever really took anything from him. As a matter of fact, I think aside from Dudley's versus Van Dam and Sabu, my only really crossing paths on camera with Van Dam is that in the very last match ever on ECW pay per view, I think I actually bring out the chair and I actually help him with the setup and assist him in doing the Van Daminator. Yes, oh. we will We will definitely get to that. Um, throughout the rest of 97, Van Dam would feud with Tommy Dreamer, even having an intergender match where Van Dam teamed with Bill Alfonso against Dreamer and Beulah. Uh, 1998, Van Dam turned face and started a feud with the Triple Threat. That's Shane Douglas, Bam Bam Bigelow, and Chris Candido. Uh, at House Party, Van Dam defeated Bam Bam Bigelow. Um, ECW... Living Dangerously, 1998, the ECW Arena. Uh, Rob Van Dam defeated Two Cold Scorpio uh, in 27 minutes and 10 seconds. Um, I, I Just going through this, seeing them in 98 having a match, knowing, as we talked about earlier, that was, you know, right first night in the door, Rob Van Dam and Two Cold Scorpio. Um but Meltzer really took this match to task. Um, Van Dam pinned two cold Scorpio in 22 minutes and nine seconds. This was supposed to be the four star classic, but it just exposed how overrated both wrestlers are by insider fans. Ugh. Van Dam has certain great talents. Uh, he has a major league personality rap and look. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard him rap. Uh, he's a fantastic athlete. He does some very unique maneuvers and has a willingness to take great punishment, has a great work rate, and takes good bumps. Before he's the next Chris Jericho, let alone the next Shawn Michaels, he needs to learn selling and psychology, but more important, transitions. This match had the feel of two guys who were minor leaguers on the indie scene trying to display every moonsault they know, but not being able to do it within the context of doing a match. Basically, the difference between an opening match promo as tech uh, as tech a rookie flyer doing corkscrew planches and shooting star presses and watching Rey Mysterio Jr. and Psychosis do less sophisticated moves, but not setting them up so amateurishly. And where Van Dam really needs to work is to learn what he does that looks good and what he does that doesn't and eliminate the latter rather than doing everything. If you look at every great worker in this business, whether they be, and then he names a bunch of Japanese wrestlers uh, and includes Bret Hart, uh, Chris Benoit, and Eddie Guerrero as well, they do what they can do. We don't know what they do that doesn't look good because we never see them do it because they figured out in the midst of a heated struggle, if they throw a spin kick that misses by a foot and a half and their opponent still sells it, it kills everything they've built up to that point. Why did Ric Flair never throw a drop kick after winning the world title? Because he didn't have a world champion caliber drop kick. Why does Misawa never do a moonsault? Why can Benoit do no wrong unless he's against Paige? Why does Van Dam ever throw a punch? It makes it makes time stand still in his matches with those lame arm punches. With no, body, with no body movement. It's more lame than watching Glacier throw kicks after seeing Dragon on the same TV show. If a match is nothing but a collection of acrobatic moves and making it look like a match isn't important, then this was the four-star match it was supposed to be. Van Dam came out wearing a Spicoli t-shirt after a screwed-up first spot Scorpio drop kicked Van Dam to the floor. They did a mildly sloppy double monkey flip spot outside the ring. Van Dam somersaulted off the ramp. Later missed a side kick off the guardrail, and Scorpio gave him a hot shot. I, it goes on and on and on. But I, I gotta stop reading that uh, for a number of reasons. But uh, he says the fans were chanting, "This match sucks." Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't there. I, I, but we'll say that that was true and, and that the boring chants he claims happened were true as well. But I did find it interesting that one point that he talked about uh, the high-flying moves, 
because it sounds a lot like the type of stuff that he currently uh, is giving six stars to. So, I mean, if a match is nothing but a collection of acrobatic moves uh, and making it look like a match isn't important, I mean, that it, a lot of people can argue that some of the matches that he has referred to as the greatest tag team match in the United States history or possibly ever, a lot of people could argue that that would have the exact same description. That was a lot there. Again, what do you guys have to say to something like that? I mean, this is Rob Van Dam and Two Cold Scorpio, as far as I'm concerned, and, and I will be honest, I have not watched this match probably since it happened, but I just find it incredibly difficult to believe that the two of them on their worst day could put on a match as apparently despicable as the match that that uh, Dave Meltzer watched. Uh, yeah, I'm a little foggy on this one, uh, ma- mainly because uh, I've been trying to figure out a way the crowbar and the joke that uh, he you know called Rob Van Dam a rapper because he was confusing him for Robbie Van Winkle, who goes by the name of <laughs> Ice. <Ike. laughs> That must have been iceberg, it. iceberg, baby. Yep. <laughs> Slickter, where are you? Yes. Prostantees.com uh, slash that was extreme. I can't tell you how hard it was to keep that in my brain as you were reading off Meltzer's review. Because yeah, I can't tell you how hard it was to keep anything in my brain while I was reading off Meltzer's review. I was having to, you know, like I'll, somebody will be talking to me and I'm like, remember this, remember this. And it's like, uh, if, <laughs> off into the ether but uh, i had to work in that joke uh yeah i'm a little fuzzy on the details of that match uh shame on me for not going back and watching that one but i can't can't envision that match being what he described um and like you said it's also uh, ironic isn't it ironic that uh, you think? a lot of the, the matches he praises now is something he condemned back then yeah yeah I mean, that, that he- stood out to me the most He's a long-time opponent of uh, Rob Van Dam's punching uh, technique and skill. He's he uh, that may or may not have been the first time he ever mentioned it, and probably wasn't the last. I know, just in general, he always would critique Rob for his punches. Um, and as far as them having the style of match that they tried or, or that they had or tried to have, you know. At the end of the day, one of the things that ECW was about was giving the fans, if it was a nine-match card, giving them a nine-course meal. And you've got a little bit of lucha, and you've got a little bit of comedy, and you've got a little bit of women, and you've got a little bit of hardcore, and you got a little bit of old-school WWF, and you've got a... It was a little... It was an appetizer. It was a dessert. It was a this. It was a that. That was Paul's MO. And I just... And also to expect the unexpected and not have it be where, because you've seen somebody wrestle before, you know what to expect. So they go out there, hit their same five spots of glory or five spots of doom. It it was about the guys being more artistic and being able to be more creative. So on that show, in giving a nine course meal, if Van Damme and Scorpio decided to take it upon themselves to have an early 90s New Japan undercard style match, or as Meltzer would refer to it, a promo Azteca opener. Um, I don't know that that's the worst thing in the world. You know, I I think uh, we liked to keep our fans for TV and especially for house shows. We like to keep them on their toes. Well, Meltzer's opinions uh, didn't slow Van Damme down because RVD would defeat Bam Bam Bigelow on the... uh, on the April 8th, 1998 Hardcore TV episode to win the ECW TV title. And this would start his historic, I want to say 700 day run with the world TV title. Um, What a, what an incredible title reign. Now as you know, that reign covered so much time and, and we don't want to go into every little bit of it because we do want to take some fan questions here. Um, but along the way, as Van Dam was uh, 
was racking up win after win as the TV champion, he and Sabu would win the tag titles. Um, now, there were only three titles in ECW. There was World, there was TV, and there was Tag. Now, two of those were with the same guy. How does the locker room react when they see this type of booking? You know, I've always wondered that, not just ECW, but like, I think back to 97 when the Hart Foundation had all the gold in WWF. Mm-hmm. Is there resentment that comes from that? Is there, or does everybody just kind of understand? Because in a lot of ways you can look at it and say, okay, we're running with them as their tag champs. He's got this long reigning TV champ. And a lot of people who maybe are looking at it going, well, I would be, you know, a contender for the TV title but there's nothing for me in that regard. Is, is there resentment? Do you remember any resentment for that? Nah, I don't remember any resentment for that. You know, there's guys who want to win belts and championships and be the best in the business. And there are guys who are going, you know, uh, it sucks to be champion because you got to carry all those belts through the airport and stuff like that. So I never heard anybody say, I never heard anybody complain about them having uh, all the belts. Joel, yeah, Meanie's, you were, with, Meanie's you were right. with the Dudleys. Were they pissed? No, they no, they didn't mind carrying the belts. I don't think, and they wound up doing it about two dozen times. But yeah, <laughs> um, but um, no, Meanie's right. You know, um, in many cases, depending on the territory, depending on the time, and depending on who was booking, you know, the the belts are just a prop. They're just a device, and a lot of guys prided themselves on not needing one. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's just the way it goes. I think if you have an entire stable or an entire faction with the gold at one time, I think it's understood that that's just going to be a a phase. It's going to be temporary. Mm -hmm. It's not going to last forever. And I think if that's what the office decides needs to happen to put heat on those heels or whatever the case might be, um, then as long as it's done in a manner that makes sense, no, I, I wouldn't think, uh, I think the kind of people that would care too much about that are the kind of people that don't go as far as they could in the business. Uh, if I, if to, to, to that point, uh, when I first got into ECW with Stevie and Raven, there was talks within the first couple months of putting the tag belts on me and Stevie just to get heat. Uh, but they thought maybe I was a little bit green at the time. I'd only been in the business a year and a half. Uh, so they didn't put the belts on us, but I think uh, me, Stevie, and Nova wound up still having a, a pretty decent career, you know, with the BWO and the parodies and stuff like that. Sometimes you you create your own attraction, you know. Yeah, I think uh, I think people definitely remember the BWO um, to this That's day. Toot, to, to. yep. <laughs> uh, ECW November to remember, nineteen ninety eight saw another match that Dave Meltzer did not care for. Um, it was Rob Van Dam, Sabu, and Taz versus the, the that's the the trio that Meanie was dreaming of earlier in the episode versus Shane Douglas, Bam Bam Bigelow, and Chris Candido, the Triple Threat. Sabu covered Douglas for the victory. Um, yeah, that he Meltzer goes on and on. And I'm going to save everybody <laughs> from having to hear it, but he goes on and on and on about uh, how bad this match was. Uh, saying uh, to borrow to borrow the phrase from the company, this match wasn't the showstopper. It was a total effing mess. Half a star. So go check that out over on uh, on the old Peacock if it's there, and uh, and let me know what you think. Um, no way, you call female Peacock. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's uh let's jump ahead to ECW crossing the line 99 in Queens, New York. Uh Rob Van Dam is about to leave those half star matches behind as RVD would face Jerry Lynn for the TV mm. title. Rob Van Dam retains uh and then again at ECW Living Dangerously 1999 from Asbury Park, New Jersey, Rob Van Dam would face Jerry Lynn for the TV title. Van Dam again uh, retains when Van Dam pinned Jerry Lynn. Um, it, it, it one minute and eighteen seconds of an overtime after going the twenty minute time limit to retain the ECW TV title. Joey Styles, uh, when the match started, heavily pushed that he believed Lynn would win, which of course guaranteed that he wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> this was a really good match with some innovative spots. It lacked in transitions and didn't build well. In fact. 
The last four minutes were the worst four minutes of the match as opposed to what it should be. Up to that point, it was really good. At one point, Van Dam was standing on the top rope for a springboard move, and Lynn drop kicked him to the floor. Lynn was draped over the guardrail while Van Dam leg dropped him off the apron, twisting and did a cross body off the guardrail into the stands. It's fun to kind of note all of these things that would become Van Dam's move set, right? Um, but Van Dam wanted to do a, a twisting leg drop, but Lynn was out of position and the crowd noticed the missed spot and died. Uh, Van Dam missed a monkey flip out of the corner and Lynn did a great sunset flip spot off of it. Lynn used a DDT on a chair for a near fall. Lynn was on the top rope with a chair, but Bill Alfonso held his leg. Uh, Lynn hit Van Dam twice with a chair while both were standing on the ropes. Van Dam came back with a Van Daminator, sending Lynn backwards off the ropes to the floor through a table. Um, series of, of near falls. Anyway, uh, a pretty decent match. And, you know, why, why wouldn't it have been a decent match? It's Rob Van Dam and Jerry Lynn, three and a half stars. Um, but next up is a weird one. Before we get to talking more about Rob Van Dam and, and Jerry Lynn, ECW Hardcore TV, April 25th, 1999, Rob Van Dam versus Devon Dudley. Uh, for the World Tag Team Championship. Yes, that's right. Rob Van Dam versus Devon Dudley for the World Tag Team Championships. Uh, Devon wins the titles for the Dudleys. Um, do you remember anything about that, Joel? I honestly didn't remember this. I don't. I, 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 I'll tell you, and people, you know, you're going to have to listen to it. I wondered if this was a typo when I read it to be honest. Um, but right. it seemed it, it's, this is Devon winning the TV title. No, the tag titles. Devon beating in a singles match, winning the tag titles could have happened. Now, okay, I don't I, remember. I, it, though. I, I, I thought we were talking about the TV. Cause I know Devon's never held the TV title. Right. Winning the tag titles in a singles match is starting to make more sense. Um, was Sabu hurt? I don't know. My, uh, I need to do some better research next time. <laughs> yeah, they held the they they held the tag titles eight times. Uh, I managed them six of those times. I want to mm -hmm. say number three through number eight, which would include this. Um, yeah, I guess even momentarily, I had forgotten that maybe one of the times uh, it had changed hands in a singles match. But yeah, I, I guess uh, yeah. you know if that's in the observer, it's got to be true. Yeah, all of our listeners. Uh, are Googling it right now. So uh, I feel <laughs> confident that all of you know uh, whether or not that actually happened. Um, after... This is the only business, by the way. Like, could you imagine if we were doing a podcast about, like, gardening? And it was like, okay, now when you went out into the garden on April 25th, 1999, yeah, right? <laughs> do you remember exactly? You know what I mean? Like, In what order, Joel, did you plant the flowers? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point. And it's, you know, so things can sometimes get lost uh, in the shovel here. But uh, after losing the tag team titles, Van Dam focused on defending the TV title um, and officially entered into a rivalry with Jerry Lynn, uh, against whom he defended the TV title at Hardcore Heaven in a no time limit match. Van Dam retained the title, and the match was deemed so good that Paul Heyman aired it on ECW's debut on TNN in place of a shoot promo about TNN that he was planning, uh, but was not allowed to air. Um, I want to I want to talk about that match though. Uh, Hardcore Heaven '99, the Mid Hudson Civic Center in Poughkeepsie, New York. It was May 16th, 1999. Uh, Nini had sold out at that point um, and was, was, uh, was in New York as the kids say. Uh, but Joel, you were there and I was there uh, and I have a table to prove it. I have a piece of the table from the Rob Van Dam, Jerry Lynn match at the end of the night. I was there. We've talked about this before. I was there helping uh, Bill Apter who was taking photographs. Um, you can see me on the W well, I guess on the Peacock network. Uh, you can see me, in the crowd wearing what can only be described as a striped shirt that is 10, 10 times too big. Um, and uh, 
I have great pictures, which I'll have to dig up and, and share here, uh, of me and Van Dam. I, I'll never forget him wearing a High Times Magazine shirt. Um, and Joel, that's where you and I first met in the, uh, in the stairwell um, that night. But uh, I believe you... Well, don't make it sound... Hey, yeah. well, hey, don't make it sound more sordid than it was unless yes. you talk about uh, <laughs> how much money you might have thrown at me. I mean, gosh, we're meeting for the first time in a stairwell. You, yes. Wait a minute. You're wearing what a... a an overly large striped shirt. So I looked what, at the picture. Trying to be the lead character and wears crybaby Waldo. Like <laughs> I, I don't get it. At like, this what? picture recently, I posted it to put myself over when Rob Van Dam went into the Hall of Fame, and uh, I saw the shirt and I'm just looking at it, going, like what? Would, like I was what? Uh, like 130 pounds, soaking wet, carrying bricks, and uh, and I'm wearing this shirt that be- that must have belonged to a 250 pound man. I it was. It was very, very uh, baggy, uh, but it was also ninety nine, and that was kind of that was kind of the thing. But at the uh, at one point in that match, Rob Van Dam uh, gets put through with a sunset flip. Jerry Lynn puts him through a table. Um, now, years later, Jerry Lynn would tell me that the reason he put him through the table with such force was because Jerry Lynn's foot actually hit the end of the table and started knocking it. Uh, towards him and he was worried that if he didn't get Van Damme through that table quickly that Van Damme was basically going to hit the side of the table so he said he just threw him with all of his might through that table the table exploded um, Van Damme told me uh, years later as well that he got a uh, they still has a scar on his lip from where the <laughs> table basically broke off and hit him um at the end of the night, they were kind of sweeping up everything because the tables, you know, they get pushed under the ring when they're cleaning up for the next match. Van Dam grabbed the table, pulled it off of the uh, the little rubber strip or plastic strip on the side of it and was like, hey, man, you want this? And it was the greatest night of my life. Uh, it was really? incredible. Perfect. I have... I. It actually, I, the picture I took with Van Dam was before he then grabbed the table. But I do have a picture of me and Joey Styles that night, both holding the table and him doing the "oh my god" face. Um, so, st- and then years later at uh, WrestleCon, about two years ago, I finally had an opportunity. I knew Jerry Lynn was going to be there. I knew Rob Van Dam was there, and I was there doing stuff for Fight TV. And uh, I said, you know what? I'm throwing this in my car, I'm driving to New York for it. And I had it in the hotel room and I went to both of them. I said, Hey, I've got this up in the room. If I grab this, can I just get you guys to sign it real quick? And they did. And I have a picture with the both of them and I have that signed table, uh, 20 years after it it happened. Um, and that is definitely, that's my prized possession as far as wrestling memorabilia, uh, that in the signed blue mini action figure. But, um, (laughs) But no, that so that's my story, my fun story from that night. Also, uh, one other little bit of that. Before the show started, uh, uh, Bill Alfonso came to me and asked if I could go run and get Rob Van Dam coffee. And I'll never forget Rob Van Dam saying to me uh, when I asked, you know, how do you want it? And he goes, lots of cream, lots of sugar. And the first thought that I had was, I don't know what that means. I don't know what does he consider lots of cream, lots of sugar, right? Like, I don't want to come back with where it's not enough. I don't want to come back where he goes, what did you do? What did you pour the entire thing in here? So I was nervous about that. Uh, Long story long, as they say, um, (laughs) he, uh, I couldn't find coffee anywhere in the building and had to come back and say, I'm sorry, I, I, there's no coffee anywhere. Uh, so if anybody saw him being a little bit slower in that match with Jerry Lynn, that's my fault. That's my fault for not being able to provide uh, coffee. But this match was so instrumental in in uh, their in both of their careers and solidifying that legacy of Rob Van Dam versus Jerry Lynn. What do you guys remember from this match? Meanie, you weren't there at the company, but you had to have seen this match. Oh, of course. Uh, just like I wasn't with the company when, uh, there was the Mar- Guerrero Malenko classic. I still, uh, yeah, this was like a modern day, uh, you know, uh, Malenko Guerrero classic, you know, the WWE had been longing for, there's been a lot of great matches since, uh, Malenko and Guerrero and the Guerrero in those early ECW days. But, and these two guys, you know, went move for move. 
I mean, it was just like there were carbon copy, carbon copies of each other, you know, just copy and paste, just different gear, you know, there was, there's so well, so evenly matched that, uh, you know, people outside the, you know, company, you know, wrestlers outside the company, I, I, you know, we're talking about it and stuff like that. That was so, something I wanted to ask. Do you remember in WWE or WWF at the time, uh, anybody talking about this match? Uh, I do. I just names escape me, but, uh, yeah, I do remember it being the talk of the, the, the wrestling business, you know, cause, and, and the only bad thing you could say about the match is maybe Jerry could have won a couple of them, you know, but you know, <laughs> that, that, that's just the whole, that goes back to the whole notion too, that you don't have to go over to get over. Cause Jerry was super, super over. And, uh, it, it, while you were talking about, you know, how, uh, I don't know what Robert Jerry said. They got a scar from that match. Rob. Yeah. Rob got a scar from that match, uh, earlier, you know, when, and he was Mr. Monday night, uh, and Jerry Lawler was there and we were hitting the ring and him Sabu when Lawler were laying people out. I remember sliding in and he hit me with a sliding baseball kick with the chair and I have a scar on my elbow somewhere. It's kind of faded. I called the Rob Van Dam. Uh, <laughs> it's on one of these elbows, but you know, this you talking about him getting a scar from the match reminded mm-hmm. me of my Rob Van Dam scar because I have different scars on my head that I have different names for. I have the Terry Gordy <laughs> up here and the Sandman back there, and, but yeah, that you just reminded me of that. Yeah, but that Jerry Lynn and RVD, uh, what a underrated feud, Joel. Uh, Bubba Ray main evented this this show. Um, do you know, and I don't know how, you know, how much you were hanging out with the Dudleys backstage, but do you remember anyone in the locker room during this, this match, watching this match and afterwards kind of going like, good God, I have to follow that. Yeah. I mean that, that, you know, that was common just in, when there were great matches just for people to just say to themselves, Oh, you know, got to go out there and kill it now. You know, um, mm-hmm. That, that 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 was just the psychology of it. I, you know, just recently I watched the similar but different um, in, in how, you know, psychologically why that is. I remember I watched the Dark Side of the Ring, uh, New Jack, mm. the bonus episode. And I remember Sandman talking about how after the Eric Kulas incident, he went out for his match and made sure he bled a whole lot more than he usually might just to try to take the heat off the incident. Mm, And when people would follow a great match, they would just have to know that their boots were laced up real tight and they were ready to go out there and have the match of their life. So yeah, I've seen that vibe a lot in the back room where people see a match and it's not this like rivalry or like, it's not like, because I, you know, I'm sure in certain territories and in certain companies, if there's too hot of a match too early on the card, that there have been main eventers who have gotten in a twist about it. Oh, and sorry. that's and that didn't ever happen in ECW, but it was more of a kind of not a rivalry, but more if anything of a sibling rivalry, kind of a good kind of a good nurture, good natured competition where it was like, oh man. You know, this guy just went out and nailed it. I got to go out there and really kill it. And, uh, and yeah, you could, you could sense that and feel that quite a bit. Uh, so ECW Heat Wave 99, Van Dam and Jerry Lynn would team together to beat Landstorm and Just Incredible. Uh, that's three and three quarter stars, that match. I should say uh, four and a quarter stars was that, that uh, Hardcore Heaven match. And again, to what Joel was saying earlier, Four stars really meant something. Four and a quarter, you were you were climbing up into uncharted territory at that point. Um, so we've got a bunch of you know a bunch of great matches. He's he's main eventing. He's uh, defending his TV title. ECW Anarchy Rules ninety nine defeats Balls Mahoney in the main event uh, to retain the TV title. Two stars, but what can you do? Uh, ECW November to Remember ninety nine. It's RVD versus Taz to retain uh, the ECW TV title. Um, This is from the Observer. Van Dam pinned Taz in 14 minutes, 34 seconds to retain the TV title. There were good moves in the match, but the two didn't work well together. And Taz's weakness 
when it comes to telling to selling was apparent. Also, Van Damme was so overhyped that it was almost a guarantee he'd come across as disappointing. Uh, it's hard to hype someone as the best wrestler in the world when you've just seen Tanaka. And from a work standpoint, they're not even in the same league. First, before he came out, they pushed about this amazing pop you'd see, unless it's Austin or Rock, or it's a tape show with fake noise being pumped in or a fake Goldberg chant that you know in advance is being piped in. You should never say that because there's no guarantee. Uh, he goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, look, not everybody's going to have the best match uh, together. He gave it two and a quarter stars, which is not nothing. And look, you know, they went out there and had a good match. Uh, Van Dam began a feud with Rhino in the beginning of 2000. Uh, RVD successfully defended the ECW World TV Championship against Rhino on January 7th. Um, got a victory during a title defense against Sabu at Guilty as Charged, which was Sabu's last match in the promotion. Van Dam was scheduled to perform in a champion versus champion pay-per-view main event against the world heavyweight champion Mike Awesome. This match potentially could have been ECW's most lucrative pay-per-view main event, and Heyman was depending on it to bring an influx of badly needed finances, but the match never occurred because Van Dam suffered a broken ankle during that successful title defense against Rhino uh, on January 29th. The injury also forced Van Dam to vacate the world TV title. Um, let's talk about that injury, the vacating of the title at this point. Meanie, are you back? Uh, this, no, I'm still, w, I'm still in WWE. Uh, but uh, personally, uh, the, the match of Rhino and Rob Van Dam is pretty cool for me because they're both Michigan boys. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Rob Van Dam was on one of my early shows. In my career and then i would later on go in to be on one of rhino's first shows ever i was on rhino's first show as a, a professional wrestler and i would wind up having in another you know couple months having a match with a young uh terry richards uh in the, the detroit area so uh to see both van dam and then later rhino is pretty cool you know knowing i've had that uh you know that connection with them uh early on in my career as well. Um, ECW Hardcore Heaven 2000. Uh, Jerry Lynn defeated Rob Van Dam, um, pinning Van Dam in 19 minutes and 50 seconds. Uh, Meltzer said this was the best match on the show, but not even close to the level of many of the previous matches. Um, with both being injured, some of the high-risk moves were cut down, uh, but the crowd heat overall for the match was disappointing. Um, again, it seemed, you know, look, I don't want to just beat up on Meltzer this entire time, but he seems very negative about everything um, that happens in all of these matches. Uh, but he gives it three and a half stars. Um, and then in uh, ECW Anarchy Rules 2000, uh, this is October of 2000, Rhino defeated Rob Van Dam to retain the TV title. Um it seems like at this point, I mean, we we know the writing is on the wall. Um, of course, we know looking back at it at this point. Uh, I should mention, by the way, uh, three and a quarter stars. Um, we know that things are really changing here in ECW at this point, and we know what's to come very soon. Uh, Van Dam was not advertised and did not show for a large number of ECW events um, due to the large sum of money that he was reportedly owed. Um, he appeared at ECW's final pay-per-view event, Guilty as Charged, where he defeated Jerry Lynn. Uh, this was Van Damme's last appearance in ECW, as ECW only held two more shows after the pay-per-view. Um, let's hear, why not, for one last time, uh, from The Observer. Van Damme, who hadn't wrestled since October 1st, looked a little rusty, but this was still a good match. Van Dam bled hard way from the mouth pretty bad from early on. He did a moonsault block off the guardrail. He did a second rope moonsault for a near fall. A lot of nice moves, although this was nowhere close to the caliber of some of the previous bouts they've done on pay-per-view. Lynn did a powerbomb off the rope, slamming Van Dam's head on a chair. 
Lin hit a German suplex after a series of reversals. Lin used a DDT on a chair. Van Dam kicked Cyrus, who tried to shove him off the top rope, but then missed his trademark frog splash, and Lin got a near fall. Uh, Gertner, Joel Gertner, then came back from the dead. I don't know when you had died, but came back from the dead and DDT'd Cyrus to a big pop. Van Dam then hit the Van Daminator finish, which, as Joel has told us, uh, he was holding the chair for, uh, which took way too long to set up to the point it was ridiculous. Uh, was Gertner after uh, <laughs> Gertner after teasing forever, uh, holding the chair for the Van Terminator, and Lynn got his brains kicked in. This may be the hottest move in wrestling right now, but the sad part is it's moves like that which keeps virtually every top guy in the business away from wanting to work with him. Three and a quarter stars. Uh, Joel, do you remember that taking a while to set up? Yeah, man, it took way too long. It took way too long? I guess. <laughs> Should have had Snickers. Uh, um, I guess. Man, so what uh, a way you to... You know what? Yeah. Uh, let's, have, let's have our listeners watch it on Peacock and let's leave it up to them because beauty's in the art of the bowl. You know what I mean? Let's, yes. let's, you know, it's art. It's not up to me to let's have the people watch the footage, you know, and let's see if they believe that it took an obvious categorical inordinate amount of time um, for us to set that move up. And uh, you can respond to us on Twitter. That was extreme. What a way uh, to go out, though. Because to me, like reading over all of this, and, and kind of, you know, I always get excited when I read about, you know, uh, the rocket on its way up, right? And, Van, and looking back on Van Dam and how he first broke in, and then we're getting higher and higher, and all these great memories that I have as a fan. And then just reading this, honestly, it was kind of, it felt like a sad end to a great run in ECW. And he would, of course, go on to WWE where he would have a literal Hall of Fame career uh, and become WWE champion uh, and become ECW world champion, uh, if you count it. Um, but, uh, spe ECW. but spearheading the ECW One Night Stand event, uh, the first one that, was, uh, that everybody really loved. Um, what's Before we get to a couple of questions, what's Rob's legacy as it relates to ECW. Um, because like I mentioned, Hall of Fame career, you can point to a million things he did since ECW, but without ECW, I don't think he has that Hall of Fame career later on. So what, Joel, we'll start with you. What is Rob Van Dam's legacy as it relates to ECW or just legacy in general? Rob was a flagship. Rob was, um, even though it was the TV title that he held, Rob was a top guy, inarguably, to the office, amongst the boys, to the fans. And then for some of the fans, he was their absolute favorite wrestler. Um, so he was a draw. He was, um, he's in High Times Magazine, and like I said, he was the, the key to us getting on MTV. Um, he was marketable. I mean, he was somebody who, even if the money wasn't there, he was somebody that every week or two weeks, the checks were cut every two weeks, every two weeks that his pay got handed to him, you always knew that he was enough of an asset and drawing enough money that you're not losing money paying Rob Van Dam. And that's the goal for any, you know, for, for if you're a performer, that's what you want. You don't want the promoter to go home feeling like, oh man, I paid that guy way too much. It wasn't worth it. And if you're a promoter, you want when you pay somebody for them to have earned every penny of it and then some. And and Rob fell into that category. He, he, he was a, a major asset he was a guy that walked around on our TV with all three companies' logos or names uh, airbrushed on his tights. I think and he tie dyed. Tie dyed, <laughs> and 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 what that meant at the end of the day was him getting to appear on WWF TV, and as a colleague of Jerry the King Lawler, 
who is a Hall of Famer in his own right, and with the Andy Kaufman stuff and David Letterman, sure. you know, he's an icon, and especially in Memphis, he's you know, so everybody knows Lawler. But uh, you know, and Rob Van Dam started out as an undercard guy in Memphis, and now he's like you know, hobnobbing with Jerry Lawler on global TV. Right. Um, but he gets to have, you know, all three companies are airbrushed on his tights. He gets to actually simultaneously be on WWE TV, WCW. He doesn't appear there, but it's as if he could at the snap of his fingers because he's got the sheets convinced that he's going there. Mm -hmm. And then he comes on our TV and he gets to be a top guy that stays, even though it seems like he could be in any of the three companies he wants to be in. So I, I think that's the legacy of RVD is that he was just a, a tour de force. I mean, just he he was, you know, he, he was he was a really bright, shining superstar in ECW for a long time, held that TV belt, which was the working belt. It was kind of our version of WWE and their intercontinental belt at certain times. That was him. And um and he has spawned people like Matt Riddle and uh, and many. He, he, he's just, I mean, his his legacy is inarguable. It's undebatable. Meanie, what do you think? Uh, I think Joel uh, summed it up perfectly. And if I could put a little bow on the top of what he said, uh, Rob Van Dam was ECW Shawn Michaels. You know, in a lot of ways, he was the... Uh, you know, which, you know, uh, inspired Rob Van Dam to say, I'm not the, uh, you know, I'm not the showstopper. I'm the whole effing show. You know, he, he was our, he was our Shawn Michaels. He was the, he was the main attraction, man. He was the real deal. And, uh, he, you know, Josh, I'm sorry, I mean, go ahead. But no, please, please, please. Real quick before I forget, you know, Josh, you said earlier when we were going through the career timeline, you said that he had turned baby face. Mm. For me, he was always a bit of a tweener. Yeah. As a heel, he was kind of a baby face heel. And as a yeah. baby face, he was kind of a smarmy heelish baby face. So for me, on a way different wavelength than Taz, he was a tweener. And that could mean that his legacy leads him to open the door in bigger companies like WWE for guys like Austin. You know, that's a great rock. That's a great point because as a baby face, traditionally, your baby face isn't walking around pointing to themselves, Bally, hey, I'm the best there is. I'm the best out there, you know? Like, it, it, and as a heel, he was pretty much just still happy to play to the crowd and, and have them chant his name. So that's a, a great point there. Um, Meany, you were to finish what oh, you were no. saying? No, that was just uh, my point. He was our, our version of Shawn Michaels. He was our Absolutely. guy. Uh, you he, could put him up against anybody on any roster, and he was still – he would shine. And I think most of our guys could do that, but like he was, you know, the, the flag bearer in a lot of ways. I've talked about it before. Um, he was a huge inspiration to me when I was trying to break into the business um, to the point where that night um, at hardcore heaven, I actually asked him about um, his, his, I almost said tie dyed his, uh, his airbrushed uh, ring gear. And he gave me, he wrote down, the phone number for the guy who does his gear. Um, and I called and it was a pretty long wait time. Um, so I ended up finding a local company here who would airbrush when I started wrestling airbrushed little things onto my singlet, which I was wearing that singlet inspired by Rob Van Dam. Years later, I would become in some circles known as somebody who has custom airbrush ties. And that is the <laughs> same person that I go to um, who did the singlets and the whole reason I've told this story before is Bill Apter had told me when I got back into the business doing interviews, he told me I need a gimmick. He said, I can't just be a guy in a suit, you know, interviewing people if I want to stand out. And he was so right. And I kept thinking, what can I do? What can I do? And I thought, well, I always loved when I had airbrushed gear and I had airbrushed gear cause Rob Van Dam. And that's what led to me saying, what if I got airbrushed ties? So, uh, I know, that didn't, that's not his legacy. You know, that hasn't necessarily set the wrestling world on fire. The fact that I have custom ties, but for me personally, um, that was an enormous influence into the, uh, you know, presentation that I have to this day. Uh, we have some great questions from the yes. wonderful folks over at ad free shows. Lots of questions. We will not be able to get to all of them, 
but let's see if we can get to some. All right, a couple of great questions here. RJ Krasinski uh, asks, do you think Rob would become a producer if given the chance? Oh, absolutely. I believe so. Uh, he definitely uh, could be a producer. Uh, I would love to see him doing stuff with the guys in NXT. Uh, to me, NXT is more of the ECW style of, of working in, in a way. You know, they're kind of like uh, that, that mold. You know, I think, you know... <laughs> What they do at what they do with NXT right now is what they probably should have did with ECW when they bought ECW. You know, mm-hmm. that being said, uh, yeah, I would love to see him as a producer and a, you know, even a coach down at the uh, performance center. Uh, question from Chris White: Were either of you there for the Taz Rob Van Dam confrontation? What can you tell <laughs> us about it, or what uh, you heard about it afterwards? This is the pick a hand story. I missed it by two minutes. Yeah. Uh, I walked, walked in the locker room and I was all jovial and like, eh. and like, I walked, I felt like I walked into a funeral cause everybody was just like, oh. you know, just everybody was just like, oh, I'm pretending I'm uh, looking in my bag. I'm like, Hey guys, <laughs> not knowing what I just missed, <laughs> you know, I'm the uh, guy, you know, cracking the joke at a funeral, you know, just, uh, I missed it by, I literally missed it by two minutes. Was it as big of a deal as it's become in, in wrestling lore to fans? I don't know. Uh, I, were you there? That was on Long Island, right? That was like the week after I November to November 98, I want to say. I didn't see it happen. I just, I, I know about it just as much, you know, I'm removed from it. I didn't, I, I wasn't in the room when it happened. So I don't know. Yeah. I was at, I was at ringside with uh, Jack victory. This is like the, the week after the pay-per-view in New Orleans. Jack Victory was in his in his, I was talking to Jack Victory because he was in a wheelchair. He broke his uh, he blew out his knee at, on the pay per view, and I helped him travel home because we both have the same flight route home. And then uh, I was catching up with him, and I go to the locker room, and everybody's just deathly silent. And it's just like I don't know. Yeah, it's like hey guys, <laughs> like I said before, and I was like I missed it by two minutes. Um. Adam I, I have a feeling after uh, if uh, Rob Van Dan gives, gets wind of any of these uh, observer reports, he's going to tell Dave to pick a hand. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Adam Arpin writes, uh, mem- any memories of your reactions to first seeing the Van Terminator? Was it something you had heard RVD speak about doing in conversation or did he hold that card close to his chest and just brought it out of nowhere? The Van Terminator, for those who don't know, is... Uh, what a lot in WWE, they call it coast to coast with uh, Shane McMahon does it. It's jumping from one side of the ring to the other with a drop kick off the top rope down into the chair with Van Dam uh, into his opponent. Do either of you remember the first time you saw that and, and what you thought? I, as far as I can remember, he kind of practiced it without doing the actual drop kick. He would do the springboard up and then jump into the ring and see how, how much distance he can get and try to gauge where he would begin, start doing the drop kick. And I believe that was in LA, Los Angeles heat wave. Maybe, um, I'm, 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 I'm a little blurry on the date, but I just remember like pre-show him just practicing the springboard and jumping into the ring and laying on his feet just to see how much distance he can get. Hmm. Joel. It's a super impressive move. I remember being impressed the first time I saw it. Um, and you know, when Rob Van Dam does it, that's one thing because he's been doing that Van Daminator, Van Terminator, and he does the split legged weight lifting and everything else. But, um, to see Shane do it, uh, was also super impressive the first time and very unexpected. And, and it's, um, also a bigger ring. astounding in a bigger ring. ring. Yeah. Yeah. Big ring. Yeah. Um, Big ring. Um, you know what they say about guys with big rings. Big fingers. Um, they work for big companies. Uh, here's a, an interesting question here. Uh, uh, Colm Smedley. Um, had RVD not gotten injured during his TV title run in ECW, might ECW have lasted? And my first thought is, what does one have to do with the other? But then I remembered in The Observer talking about how that match with Mike Awesome 
was dreamt to be this, you know, massive main event match that was going to be the highest grossing main event in the history of ECW and how Paulie was needed that and was waiting for that. Whether there's truth to that or not, who can say? Um, Do you think that Rob Van Dam having to disappear for a chunk of time at that point um, played a role at all? Or do you think that that ship was going down no matter what? I think if, uh, you know, even if Rob stayed there and they drew the biggest drawing pay-per-view match of in ECW's history, there's still the issue of TNT making ECW pay for all their production and all their uh, right. other stuff that really bogged the company down. You know, it wasn't like, you know, the company wasn't making money. It's just that when they got this thing that was supposed to be the their their ticket to the moon, you know, Mm-hmm. TNT, I mean, I mean, uh, TNN, I'm sorry. Uh, TNN, the Nashville network was like, oh yeah, well you got to pay for your all own production. Uh, no, uh, commercial time. We're not, we'll advertise rollerball, but we won't advertise ECW. So I remember seeing buses going around Philly with roller jam or roller jam on the side of the bus. Cause I'm like, man, where's the ECW stuff, you know? But, uh, there's still and them advertising our show during our show. And we, we complained about it, like, but you, the people are already watching. Why would you put it on during our show? They would turn it around and say, well, that's the wrestling. We have one hour of wrestling every week. We're putting it on during the wrestling show. That's the demographic. So, yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> that makes no sense whatsoever. But, I mean, I get I get what you're saying. It makes no sense. People are already – that's – if we paused right now because we want to run a quick ad – for ad free shows and that was extreme no other show on ad free shows but we want to run a quick ad right now for that was extreme on ad free shows what that is a waste of time it's so it's yeah that's yeah. fascinating to me i didn't even remember that they had done that yeah. man craziness well thanks tnn um <laughs> thanks, uh TNN. last uh Last couple of questions here. Um, C seed 17. What was Rob's demeanor like backstage after matches when he was at his peak in ECW? Was he the type to be upset about what didn't go perfectly or as mellow and low key as he always seems to be? Yeah, Rob was always cool, man. Uh, and even if by chance something went wrong, he'd be like, ah, dude, Sorry. And then I go, oh, that's okay. Yeah, just typical, just like, you know, West Coast cool, just, oh, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ah, dude, sorry about that. You know, blah, blah, blah. And it just, I, I never really saw Rob lose his cool. I never saw his voice go above a certain, you know, uh, volume. He was just always laid back. And if you tried to get to him, he would even be act even cooler. <laughs> <laughs> uh joel same thing same thing rob, rob was super laid back um out of him and sabu sabu <laughs> took it seriously and uh and rob did not take it as seriously so so that when you saw the two of them doing all those promos uh that everybody remembers them so fondly for uh it really really is art imitating life and it really really is kind of sabu turned up on 12 and Rob turned up on 12. Uh, that, that's really just how they were. Yeah. Sabu made up the slack. <laughs> the last question here, uh, Antonio Santos. If done right, would Joel Gertner make a great manager for RVD? As my biggest fan... I'd say since you prefaced with if it's done right, I'd have to say you've sold me and there probably is a way. Uh, To be fair, um, as a singles wrestler, uh, I don't think he needs a manager. I think, you know, we talk about if he wanted to, he could be a producer. Mm -hmm. And I think he could also just as well be a manager if he wanted to, he's got a great wrestling mind. Uh, he's got charisma. He can talk. He's got a brand, a fully established gimmick. He's promoting his own businesses and everything else right now. 
And, um, you know, in the day, uh, could that have worked? Uh, maybe before the Dudleys, they tried me with a bunch of guys. Um, so maybe, but, um, but he also wouldn't need it. He didn't need it. Well, that's it for us here, everybody. Um, man, Rob Van Dam, we, 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 I feel like we only scratched the surface and there was so much that we had to talk about. Um, Rob Van Dam, one of, he's in my top five favorites of all time. Um, and, uh, and I know just from the, the outpouring in the poll here at adfreeshows.com, uh, he's a lot of other people's top five favorites as well. Um, Thank you to adfreeshows.com for hosting us. Make sure to follow us on social media at That Was Extreme and individually as well. They are at Blue Meanie BWO and at Stud Muffin Says. And I am at So Says Chernoff. Don't forget to check out our podcast as well. Joel's is the 69 minute eargasm. And of course, you can find where, myself where? Where we where? have interviewed Rob Van Dam. Yes. On a Valentine's Day episode with his amour, Katie Forbes, and where we have also done an episode with Sabu. And if you're interested in Rob Van Dam, if you're interested in Sabu, if you're interested in the time in Memphis, also, by the way, um, buy Sabu's book. Yeah. Because yeah. proceeds for all of Sabu's merch right now are going to um, Melissa Coates, uh, his, uh, his wife going to her prosthetic leg and her uh, medical issues. So if you're interested in stuff like you've heard today, 69 minute eargasm, Rob Van Dam episode, 69 minute eargasm, Sabu episode, and absolutely buy the Sabu book that he and Kenny Casanova have put out, which has um, self written pages by many of the members of the ECW roster with their firsthand memories of Sabu related anecdotes. It's an amazing, amazing read. Yeah. Awesome. I got the right, I got to write something for that book and I'm very proud of it. Very cool. Yeah. Please check that out. Also, we should note that Rob Van Dam has, uh, his documentary headstrong, um, yes. which is, is absolutely worth a, a watch. Um, but yes, again, check those episodes out. Uh, 69 minute eargasm. And of course, you know where you can find myself in the Blue Meanie every Monday. As I said in the beginning, every Monday it drops on Monday. We're there over at the Mind of the Meanie podcast. Uh, and you can go to mindofthemeanie.com to pick up. I've got them here. The brand new Mind of the Meanie action figures. They're here. Here's the card they come on. It's fantastic. These are incredible. They come There's on that card? Oh well, yeah, not yet. They're not you have even to pull breathing heavy. Back? Um, <laughs> the only <laughs> thing missing from this right now is Joel Gertner. Yeah. Oh. Well, so, who made those Cella toys? Cella toys made those. So uh, I've got an email in my inbox from Cella toys. I hope they're yeah. not the kind of company that you know. If you don't reach back out to them within two or three weeks, they get upset. If they, if they, you know, if they're time flexible, hopefully, uh, if they're interested. Um, you know, we might be able to make something work out. I, I would love to have something that could go up on the mantle next to those two and make a complete that was extreme action figure set. I love the idea out. of that. And uh, Cella Toys, they're an awesome company to work with um, and uh, make an incredible product. And no, they don't seem to be people who would be offended by, uh, by a busy man such as yourself taking a little time to get back to them. And I think the wrestling world in general is drooling over the idea of that Joel Gertner action figure. So, uh, so you know, hopefully we can make that happen soon. But these can be purchased over at mindofthemeanie.com or mindofthemeanie.bigcartel.com. That's where you can pick these up. If you're outside the U.S., go to cellatoys.net. Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure they've sold out at this point, but we still have a few left here. Um, for Joel Gertner and the Blue Meanie, I'm Josh Chernoff. This has been a blast. Thank you all for joining us. And we will see you again as we remember more people and moments from a time that was extreme.